Hi everyone, welcome back to Numinosophy Academy, I'm Lewis. So today we're going to be discussing the Book of Abraham, which is to say the least, hashtag problematic. So problematic, in fact, that the issues surrounding that book's creation have probably resulted in more people leaving the Mormon church than anything else. More people losing their testimony, as Mormons say. Losing their testimony that Joseph Smith is really a prophet, that the Book of Mormon is true, and that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church of the Restoration. So monumental are the problems surrounding the Book of Abraham that apologists for the Mormon Church really have to bend over backwards and achieve some incredible mental gymnastics in order to square the circle, which is the Book of Abraham. So as usual, we'll be getting into this subject by reacting to a couple of videos this time on the Saints Unscripted Mormon YouTube channel. And we'll be getting straight into that just as soon as you do me a favor and like this video for the YouTube algorithm. It helps out my channel a lot. Okay, so the title of the first video that we'll be reacting to today is Does Egyptian papyri prove Joseph Smith made up the Book of Abraham. So in general, we don't know a whole lot about how Joseph Smith received his scriptural translations and revelations, but we do know that the process was sometimes different depending on the project. Uh, just to state the obvious here off the bat, this being an apologetics channel for the Mormon Church, the assumption here is that the Book of Abraham is true. And so they're not trying to prove to you that the Book of Abraham is true. That's not the purpose here. Rather, they're just trying to downplay the significance of the problems for those who already believe it. Sometimes he used the Urim and Thummim or Seer Stone. Sometimes a scripture seemed to just catalyze a sudden revelatory scriptural expansion. Doctrine and Covenants 7 is a translation of a document written by John the Revelator that Joseph didn't even physically have. In other times, it's unclear how much came from Revelation and how much came from Joseph just hitting the books. You hit those books! Okay? You hit those textbooks! Consid so, the way these different books came into existence, you know, this is where the real problems arise. So. Does the Book of Mormon have itself problems surrounding it? Yes, it does. But they're not as large as the problems surrounding the Book of Abraham because you cannot verify um, the story that Joseph Smith makes concerning the Book of Mormon quite so easily. So the Golden Tablets, you know, came into Joseph Smith's um, possession, and then he used the revelatory stones in the hat, the words appeared on the stones, uh, those words were then taken down in dictation, etc, etc, etc. Eventually the, um, the golden plates were, what, taken back up into heaven? Something like that. So there's no way to verify, um, you know, using anthropological research, whether Joseph Smith's story surrounding the Book of Abraham is true. There are other accounts, as we just heard, where it just comes as pure revelation. And again, that can't be tested. You know, that's just a matter of, of faith. Do you believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet who is capable of receiving those revelations? However, there that's where the problems surrounding the book of Abraham come in. Because in this case, it's not that it just came as revelation, nor did it come as a physical um, manuscript, supposedly, that was then taken away for some reason. No, these are actual pieces of papyri that came into Joseph Smith's possession. He claimed to translate them, and now Egyptologists can look at those same pieces of papyri and say what they really mean in terms of, uh, you know, Egyp Egyptian studies, and state that they don't say anything like what Joseph Smith claimed they said. Considering how little we know about the process underlying his revelatory projects, it's not surprising that we really don't know exactly how Joseph produced the Book of Abraham. Now, Joseph did have in his possession ancient Egyptian papyri that he believed contained the writings of Abraham. 
Unfortunately, a good portion of the original papyri was destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. And that also is very convenient. Sir, I find it decidedly inconvenient. In the so, I mean, that's really a red herring, I think. You know, it allows the Mormon church to say that if only we had the other pieces of papyri, you would be able to see that if they were translated by Egyptologists, it really was um, writings from the, you know, patriarch of the Old Testament, Abraham himself. Now, that suggests that claims were not made about the pieces of papyri that we do have, but claims were made about the pieces of papyri we do have. And that is what undermines significantly the claims made for the Book of Abraham's legitimacy. In the 1960s, some surviving fragments resurfaced, including the original illustration or vignette for facsimile one. Generally, people fall into one of three categories outlined by Egyptologist John Gee. People believe that Joseph produced the Book of Abraham from the surviving fragments of papyri we still have, from papyri that was destroyed that we no longer have, or he produced it without the aid of any papyri at all. So, let's just quickly go through those, those three possibilities. The papyri that we do have. Now, it's not the case that some people believe it and some people don't. The claims that the papyri that we do have being legitimate, that's actually in the Pearl of Great Price itself, because the facsimile that was mentioned earlier, that I'm sure we'll probably get onto in this video, that's in the Pearl of Great Price. And the claim is that the that image results in the Book of Abraham. So the first one on here is the actual claim of the church of Joseph Smith. So the only way you can get around that is to say that Joseph Smith was wrong. And I think that should be what the church's position is. You know, the Joseph, Joseph Smith, um, as prophets have proven themselves to be, are at times fallible. And this is an example of his fallibility. The second option, that, that there are papyri that were from the prophet Abraham, that were just, you know, happened to be lost or burnt up in the fire, I mean, there's no way of arguing against that because they're lost. But I just find it such a weak argument. But I guess, you know, if, if you want to believe that, then, then there's nothing stopping you. The third, from no papyri at all. Now, that does work. It, you know, you, ha you have to say that Abraham is wrong because he did claim it came from the papyri. But if you just say that that part was wrong and that he received the... Um, revelation in the same way that he did for other um, uh, books, um, just, you know, through pure revelation, and that resulted in the book of Abraham, that's far less problematic, I think. Um, or I think there's a fourth option um, that I'm not, they might hint at later on, I'm not sure, that the papyri wasn't translated, but helped him kind of get into the right mental headspace or helped him, you know, channel himself into the ancient period in which Abraham would have lived. And therefore, the papyri isn't doing nothing, um, but it's not resulting directly in translation. The first theory is heavily advocated for by antagonists of our faith. The text from the surviving fragments does not translate as the Book of Abraham. Instead, they contain pieces of so-called funerary texts, such as the Document of Breathings made by Isis, also known as the Book of Breathings, belonging to a guy named Hor, and multiple copies of a text known as the Book of the Dead. Yeah, I think they're stating that a bit too strongly, a bit too categorically. There are many Mormons in the church that believe the facsimiles do translate into the Book of Abraham. So to just say that, well, that's what anti-Mormons advocate as being the position of the church, and we can prove that that's wrong, I think that's too simplistic. That's not to say that the church hasn't... If the church has moved on to the point where they simply dismiss the idea that the uh, papyri is legitimate, 
then I think that is a step in the right direction. The Book of the Dead. Are you sure you want to be playing around with this thing? The next question is, well, what about facsimile 1? It's right there on the surviving papyri. Doesn't it make sense then that the text surrounding this illustration should translate to what we have in the Book of Abraham? That makes sense to me. Well, to us that might make sense. In ancient Egyptian scrolls, however, sometimes these illustrations had no clear relationship with their surrounding text. And feel free to pause and read these quotes from people smarter than I am who back that up. In fact, this same guy, Hor, also owned a copy of the Book of the Dead written by the same scribe and illustrator, and more than half of the pictures don't match with the text surrounding them. No! You must not read from the book! On top of that, there are actually no other instances of this scene being adjacent to the Book of Breathings. I find this argument terribly weak. You really expect me to believe that Joseph Smith put facsimile one there in the book of Abraham next to the text, not believing that it was the book of Abraham. Come on, that is such a terrible argument. So while the text may not belong to the book of Abraham, the text also doesn't seem to belong to facsimile one, raising the question, what does facsimile one belong to? I don't belong here. I don't belong anywhere. The second theory is that Joseph got the Book of Abraham from a long roll of papyrus that has since been destroyed. This theory accommodates the eyewitness evidence I quoted earlier, but it also comes with its challenges. For example, if facsimile one was originally attached to this long roll, some scholars disagree on whether the scroll would have been long enough for both the Book of Breathings and the Book of Abraham. But it's also possible that the long roll wasn't Hor's scroll at all, but one of the others that was destroyed. This theory is frustrating both to members and non-members simply because it can't be verified since we don't have the papyri. The third theory is that the text that was revealed to Joseph had nothing to do with any of the papyri and it only served as a catalyst that sparked the flow of revelation. There is a precedent for this kind of revelation in some of Joseph's other works, but the challenge is that Joseph definitely believed he had a physical document containing Abrahamic writings. Yeah, so Joseph Smith believed it and therefore he was wrong about this. But I certainly find this um, argument the least problematic because the papyri clearly has and never had any relationship to the text. And so it can only act as a catalyst in this way. So this theory would assume that Joseph was wrong about that and that the papyri just set him on a revelatory path. You are free to believe whichever theory you'd like, or none of them at all. What if I choose not to believe it? Now, there are still many other unanswered questions associated with the Book of Abraham. For example, lots of people have questions about Joseph's interpretations of the facsimiles. We're going to dive into that in a separate episode, so if you have questions about the facsimiles, Hold on to those. Others also wonder about the historical believability of the Book of Abraham. That also deserves an episode, but until then, I'd refer you to this video. So, yeah, <laughs> the trouble is, he did give a translation for the facsimiles, and I think that's what we're going to be getting onto in the next video here. So, the next video that we'll be reacting to is titled Joseph Smith's Wrong Interpretation of the Book of Abraham facsimiles. So he did attempt to translate the facsimiles and quite simply his translation of those facsimiles is wrong as we will now get into. So there's a lot we could discuss about the facsimiles but let's just jump right into the controversy because why not? Bring it on. Booyah! Do Joseph's interpretations of these Egyptian illustrations match those of modern Egyptologists? And the answer to that is in general no, they don't. For example, Joseph said this was about Abraham on Pharaoh's throne talking to Pharaoh's court about astronomy. But Egyptologists say it's a deceased individual being led to the throne of Osiris, god of the underworld. So how do we reconcile these apparent misinterpretations? I don't know. Well, people generally fall into one of three categories when it comes to the interpretations of the facsimiles. Nothing is inspired everything is inspired, or some parts are inspired and some are not. The first group believes that since there are discrepancies between what Egyptologists say and what Joseph said, 
nothing about Joseph's interpretations are inspired. In other words, Joseph made it all up. You calling me a liar? I ain't calling you a truther. Some people present this case as if it's a smoking gun and that anyone who still believes Joseph was a prophet is being willfully ignorant or academically dishonest. So it is a smoking gun depending on how you understand Joseph Smith to be a prophet. So was Joseph Smith wrong about some things? I don't think you can get away from that. It seems evident that he was. He was wrong, you know, in as far as he did believe that some things were from God, were true, he believed them to be true, that just evidently were not. I don't see how you can be a contemporary Mormon and not think that, not believe that. So the question is not, was he wrong? He was wrong. The question is, given that he was wrong, to what extent does that challenge or bring into question Joseph Smith's prophetic nature? Can he still be a prophet and be wrong? And I don't see that as necessarily a deal breaker. I think it's at least conceivable that Joseph Smith received revelation from God, was a prophet, and did speak truth up to a certain point, you know, received revelation and was inspired in his writing for the Book of Mormon, say, but that that only took him so far. And at a certain point, his ego got away from him and he claimed more than it was reasonable to claim. You know, he believed himself to be the great man. And when these pieces of papyri arrived, he made claims which were actually above and beyond his station. I don't know. You're certainly free to believe that. It's an easy way to shrug off Joseph's prophetic claims. And this theory can explain the things Joseph got wrong, but it fails to explain the things Joseph actually got right from an Egyptological perspective. For example, putting yourself in Joseph Smith's day when virtually nothing was known about ancient Egyptian, what would be your guess as to what these four figures from facsimile 2 represent? Joseph said they represented this earth in its four quarters. Modern Egyptologists say that these are the four sons of Horus, and one of their roles was to represent the four cardinal directions. Okay, so again, I find this kind of rationalization very weak. If you, you know, are shooting a bow and arrow blindfolded at a target, you're going to miss most of the time. But very occasionally, you're going to hit the target. At no point does Joseph Smith get a bullseye, but he hit the target a few times. That doesn't prove anything. Joseph gets this one right. Average Joe's wins in a shocking upset. I feel shocked. Or take this figure from facsimile one. What would you imagine this crocodile might represent? Joseph said it was the idolatrous god of Pharaoh. Modern Egyptologists say it's probably the crocodile deity Sobek, who, among other things, was closely associated with the Pharaoh of Egypt. Oh no! Once again. Again, that's, you're wildly off then. You know, every animal in ancient religious systems are deified. And so, it's not... It's not an incredible guess to make. And Joseph nails it, and other examples could be given. The second theory is that everything Joseph said about these three illustrations is inspired and correct, and we're just missing too many pieces of the puzzle to be able to understand how that is. Something here I'm not quite getting, though I try, I keep forgetting. So this would assume that Egyptologists are either wrong or barking up the wrong tree altogether. Maybe Joseph was never giving an interpretation of what ancient Egyptians would have thought about these illustrations. Maybe it's how ancient Jews in Egypt would have interpreted them. Or maybe they held unique meaning to the priests who had access to these papyri. There are several different theories, but unfortunately none of them can be proven. Yet, theory two is on the table. The third option is that Joseph's interpretations are partially inspired and partially not. Yeah, it's 50-50. Latter-day Saints certainly believe that prophets, just like any human, can get things wrong sometimes. Even the introduction to the Book of Mormon itself says, if there are faults, they are the mistakes of men. It's clear that Joseph Smith was very interested academically in these ancient Egyptian artifacts. Again, I think the catalyst argument that was made in the previous video is far stronger. It holds, it holds far more water, I think. 
And as most any person of faith could probably attest to, sometimes it's not always easy to differentiate between your own thoughts and opinions and revelation from the Spirit of God. That may sometimes have been the case for Joseph Smith as well. This theory could explain how he nails some of these interpretations that he should have been clueless about, and why many of his other interpretations don't match what modern Egyptologists think they should mean. I was way off. I knew it started with an S, though. But that begs the question, why would God allow Joseph to get some of this wrong? I don't know, but it could be that these mistakes, if that's what they are, just weren't all that doctrinally significant. Joseph said this guy's name was Shulam. Egyptologists say it's Hor. I wouldn't care if it turned out to be Steve. It isn't doctrinally important. Steve. The Latter-day Saint. Yeah, I don't think that works either. I think some of the wrong claims that Joseph Smith made were doctrinally significant. So, you know, it requires us to be discerning in the way that we read and understand Joseph Smith. Since the text of the Book of Abraham is infinitely more important than the facsimiles. In all reality, we rarely do anything in our faith with the facsimiles. They're fun curiosities, but not super relevant to our beliefs. Yeah, the facsimiles just create a problem. It would be far easier to justify the, the, the book of Abraham if the facsimiles were just not there, if they were removed. And then you could just say that the text of the book of Abraham was inspired through him coming into contact with various pieces of papyri. That, that almost solves this problem. The believability of the text of the book of Abraham is much more important. And for more info on that, check out this video from Pearl of Great Price Central. So those are the three theories that people generally adhere to. Pick whichever one you believe is right or none at all, but also try to understand and respect those who adhere to a different theory than you, whether you're a member of our faith or not. Check out the resources and notes in the- Respect, respectfully disagree, I would say. But anyway, thanks for watching, everyone. Um, as always, please do like this video. Um, subscribe for future content if you're interested in the beliefs which motivate us to live life in the way that we do. And, uh, you know, also hit the bell, the notification bell, so you don't miss out on any videos that I release. Um, thanks again, and I will see you in the next one.